Welcome to iFab Online. Welcome to iFab Online. iFab Online for your welcome. Welcome to iFab Online. I'm Sean O'Hara with O'Hara Management Consultants and Faculty at Cal Lutheran University. Today we're here to discuss international fundraising as it pertains to fundraising in Asia for Africa. I have two esteemed colleagues with me today. Please help me welcome my esteemed colleagues, Usha Menon, Executive Chairman of Usha Menon Management Consultancy, headquartered in Singapore. Usha's company works exclusively with the nonprofit and social purpose sectors across Asia. Also with us today is Melanie Daniels, the Executive Officer of the Unique Foundation. The Unique Foundation provides support to nonprofit organizations who are not able to engage the services of a full-time fundraiser. Melanie joins us from her desk in Africa. Welcome both of you. It's nice to have you with us today. I would like to kind of start by kicking it off with Usha. So if you wouldn't mind spending 15 or 20 minutes giving us an overview of fundraising in Asia for Africa. Um, and, and please start by introducing yourself with a bit more detail so that the rest of the audience can know um, how really fabulous and gifted you are. Please, Usha, welcome. Hello, this is Usha Menon, and I'm beaming from Singapore. I'm so delighted to be part of IFAB 2020 and to talk about fundraising, both between Asia and Africa. And there's so much happening that I would like to share with you some of my experiences, some observations, as well as some insights that I have been gathering that may be of help to you in your efforts for raising funds for the awesome work that's being done on the African continent. What I want to share with you is three points. First of all, the corporate sector. All the companies from Asia that actually works in Africa, that's a great opportunity to get engaged with them in a way that it meets the needs of the communities in which they work. The second point I want to talk about is high net worth Asians. People who have traveled and lived in Africa and now are based in Asia. How do we engage with them? And I'll share with you some tips on that. And the third point was Generation Next, the youth of Asia. And having worked closely with them, I know they are global citizens and they really want to make a difference and I share some insights into how they think and feel about working with their youth friends in Africa. So let me start with the corporate sector. Some of the names are very well known. You have Samsung, you have Sony, you have LG, you have Tata. All Asian organizations and corporate sectors who are having a presence in various parts of Africa. And if you really look just at the smartphone data, with Huawei and Samsung taking the lion's share of the smartphone usage in Africa, that's a big presence. And even if you don't know uh, where they work, who are the people who own them. In your backyard, chances are there are dealers, there are distributors of these brands. That may be a possibility that you can collaborate with. The graph that I'm showing you, while there is a substantial 22 million, say in Samsung smartphone alone, even if you take just a very small 5%, that's over a million individuals who actually own a Samsung phone. And that means these retailers and the corporate has data on who are these individuals. Why am I telling you this? Because I've found that if you can reach out to that segment, 
and talk to them in a way that you can collaborate to give a better customer experience, to work with vendors and suppliers in a more constructive manner, not just a grand proposal, but really thinking of ways in which you can creatively engage the corporate sector, there is funds to be raised. And not just funds, money, but relationships, networks, collaborations, that's possible. The same goes with the Indian companies. Again, I've given you a list of some of the bigger known names like the Tatas, the Godrej, the Bharatis, Mahindra Mahindra, and so on and so forth. But then there are others too, as I've highlighted you in the other table, and locations at which these organizations work. How can you work with these organizations, be they Japanese companies, Korean companies, Indian companies, Chinese companies? I would start with doing some research. Where is these or where are these organizations interested in? And what kind of areas of need do they want to address? So if you look at some of the annual reports or the sustainability reports of these companies, like I have given, like you see in this slide, they identify which of the sustainability development goals in this particular case, LG wants to focus on. And if the work you do comes in that space, chances are reaching out to them and talking about them in their language make a big difference. The other point I wanted to talk about was high net worth people. Now, Lara, she and a family from Mumbai, India, travels to Africa six times a year. And every single family vacation, they spend 80,000 pounds. Now, why am I giving you this information? I would love for you in the comment section, just put down your thoughts. Why is this information useful or how will you use this information in your fundraising strategy in your thinking. If a family like Lara's spends 80,000 British pounds six times a year in Africa, be it Botswana, be it Rwanda, wherever they go. And the other thing they like is going, they have a bucket list of eating at all the top restaurants in Africa. That's what they do. That's the lifestyle. Do you know where they eat? Do you know which resort they lived in? Do you know where those chartered planes that bring them in? Chances are it's in your backyard, if, especially if you're in a tier one city. I would love for you to think of, do you know an agent that brings in people like Lara to your state, to your country? And is there a way in which you can engage with them? And I'm saying this because I know you can. You can work with them to provide them with an ability to make a difference while they are in Africa. But right now with COVID, travel's not happening. And that's why I wanted to share with you the next slide. What happened to that 80,000 pound that Lara would have spent on a single trip that's on the table. So this is an example of how in Singapore, when COVID struck, we wrote to every person we knew who drove. You know, of course, you need to figure out how to get the data of people who have a car. And that's very easily do doable. Your donors themselves may have it or different, you know, as I said, the resort, if there is a collaboration, you could figure out who are those people. And online, we just asked, will you give up your petrol spend so that we can help causes that in this time where COVID has brought a standstill to a lot of funding, you could pass on that petrol spend towards charity. How does Lara come into this picture? 
what happens to the 80,000 pounds per vacation that she has not spent for the past six, seven months. So if you could reach out to someone like her and say, would you, since you've not spent that amount of money, still make a difference in the lives of African children, the continent, the climate, the animals, whatever the cause that you're supporting, would you donate part of that towards a cause? Like in the case of donating tickets, in the case of the art. When COVID came about, a lot of these concerts didn't happen, but people have been setting aside money to buy tickets. If you did not use that ticket, can that amount be donated? $2,000 just because you asked. And that isn't that the fundamental of fundraising. Fundraising is about giving people an opportunity to make a difference. They may choose not to give or they may choose to give. And highly likely, they would choose to give. So I just wanted to share this idea that can you work with individuals or organizations that actually have been working with Asians, you know, this high-end tourist or otherwise, to look at opportunities of collaboration, of introducing them to your cause during their time in Africa or online, and then moving on to ask them whether they would come on a journey with you of relationship, not a transaction, not just will you make a donation, but will you understand the need and hence the way in which you can support. And I found that's very powerful because once a person knows why the money is being asked and they feel connected to it, the stories impact, then highly likely they go on the journey. And in order to be good at your digital outreach, one of the things I do in Singapore is run an accelerator on how to do fun digital fundraising. You could figure that out in your own organizations. What is it I need to do in order to be digitally savvy so that boundaries are no longer a limitation? I can reach out because I, I can reach out through the internet. So some of the things that the accelerator that I run teaches the charities and their leaders and their fundraisers are how to do email outreach. Is it possible for you to collaborate with one of the resorts that bring in individuals like Lara or otherwise to me have an email outreach with them because you have a solid story to tell? How can you make sure the story you tell is impactful? How can you use Facebook? For example, this is the Instagram page of LG, the Korean electronics company. They have over 73,000 followers from Africa on their Instagram account. How, are you one of them? Are you understanding? What are some of the things that make the users that of LG's products tick? Is there a way in which you can collaborate with LG to reach out to the 73,000? Or Sony, the Japanese brand. They have 1.3 million Facebook users just in Africa. Friends of Sony. 1.3 million. Can you figure out how you are able to engage with this database, which is very much active in Africa. So it is not just about the corporate as a company where you write for a grant proposal, you know, for a grant. It's about that matching their customer base. So it's not just about Asia helping Africa. It's also the users of an Asian brand in Africa 
working together to make something bigger, better happen. So those are some of the ideas I would like to share with you because I find that that works. Of course, if you just want to sit behind your laptop and your Excel slide forms and do a aid proposal, well, that's your choice. But then there's something just so not right about aid, especially in this time and age. It's about collaboration. It's about partnerships. It's about working together. And all of these ideas totally excites me rather than just write a handout aid proposal because we've moved on. Africa has, Asia has. And I think as fundraisers, we need to move on too. And that brings me to talking about Generation Next. Our international schools, for example. There are so many schools across Asia. And I've just given you one example from China. It costs 30,000 pounds to put a child into international school. And very often, they come from families that are willing and able to support courses anywhere in the world. How are you in your overall fundraising portfolio looking at specific areas in Asia that you can connect with? And international schools being one very, I find, a good way. Because not only are you reaching out, seeking support, but you're also giving these young minds an ability to understand and empathize with Africa the way you want it. The narrative is yours. So you can say it the way you want Africa to be positioned. And isn't that what we want, whether I'm an Asian or you're an African? We want the narrative to be the way we want it, as opposed to what an outside lens tells us we are. And I find working with these young minds in Asia through international schools gives an opportunity to connect. This slide is just a sneak peek into just a few days back, me working with students from the international school across China, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong, and I want you to listen in to what they had to say because these kids are actually raising funds for the sanitation, the toilets in Africa. They have chosen that as a project. And they're talking to me and I ask them, why do you want to do it? So I want you to listen to what they have to say. You know, why do you want to help? So can I start with the man in the group, Hank? Can I ask you? Mm, well, just one minute, you know, why are you doing this? Yes, I want to support Africa because um, I want to improve my experience and I want to try to help others as I can. Um, and I think it's unfair that I have a toilet, but they don't. Mm -hmm. so, I want to help them to have a clean place for pooping. As much as I can to help them. And also, like, Africa is a new culture for me. I, I don't know them much, so I think I should try some new things. Like, for me, it's a good thing, too. So it's a double win, I think. Yes, I want to improve my sense of social responsibility. And I, and I want to help the children in Africa. The projects will be a good platform to con connect me with the world. I've actually been to Africa twice. I went to Kenya once and went to those like little villages and I saw how like bad the condition is. Like they don't actually have like an actual toilet and I felt like very sad because I care a lot about hygiene. So yeah, I really want to help those people. When I was in like fourth grade, I think, uh, my mom uh, put on um, like my mom are selling like my two paintings for like a charity and uh, it sold over 10,000 RMB. Yeah, and that is when you're four years old. That is 10 years back. <laughs> now, 10 years now, people are so much more 
prosperous, I would say, compared to 10 years back, right? You heard from them. And it's so inspirational for me because they're not saying, oh, you know, we want to send money to Africa because they're poor. They're saying it's a win-win. I learn about a culture I've known not, known not much about. And that's the kind of world I am most excited about. Where fundraising is not about money. Fundraising is about meeting a need that exists in our community. And we do it in a collaborative relationship way. Rather than just write a grant proposal for an aid. I hope this has been of some value to you. I'll see you to answer some of your questions soon. And I sure hope uh, your comments um, uh, it will also inspire me to understand the way we do fundraising between Africa and Asia. With that, I'd like to say thank you. If you ever want to stay in touch with me, you, my website uh, is on the slide. And we can keep up this conversation uh, in a moment. Bye-bye. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Usha. Lovely presentation. And I have to say, I love those kids and why they want to support Africa. I thought that was really lovely. Thank you for taking the effort to, to meet with them. Uh, our next speaker is, is Melanie Daniels. And as I, as I mentioned, Ma Melanie is the executive um, Chief Executive Officer of the Unique Foundation, and we're excited to have her with us today. Um, Melanie, please share with us your thoughts about fundraising for Africa in Africa. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. It's wonderful to be part of such an amazing platform. And um, just a little bit about me. After being part of the corporate world for many years, um, I was exposed to the desperate need for funding in our communities, not only in um, South Africa where I'm resident, but more in the whole of Africa. Um, and because of that need, I realized that being part of one organization was not impacting enough of the community that we needed to. I then decided to, after 18 years experience working in communities, I then uh, founded Unique Foundation in 2018 and focused on the growth and sustainability of organizations in desperate need of a fundraiser. These organizations are not necessarily all situated in an urban area. Many of them are out in the rural areas. And because of that, they lack the ability to access funding, funding opportunities, and basically to achieve resources to get their companies sustainable and stable. And hence the reason why I decided that I was going to establish an organization that could assist more than one at a time. Unique Foundation currently supports 11 organizations covering the, the following sectors, charities, education of youth, youth skills development, women empowerment, arts and culture, and whoever requires our services. So that's just a little bit about me. I would like to share more information with you now on fundraising in Africa. Just touching on the philanthropic landscape in Africa. Philanthropy takes so many forms, um, such as private foundations, trusts, corporate foundations, community chairs, and community foundations. More often than not, um, this platform is misunderstood. And, you know, many of the organizations believe that the, the rich have to invest in the poor. And in this way, many of the rich are made patrons of the organizations. And yet in, in most of our communities, it is the poor that is actually supporting that very organization by coming together and holding events. And um, basically, you know, individuals from that area will, will support in giving um, from the very little that they have. But this is to impact the, the next generation, really. So there are many factors that motivate people to give. And I believe that as long as the investor understands the reason for the giving, the project itself, and how it's going to impact either that organization or that charity, an investor wants to know that, you know, the funding that he's actually supplying will be utilized 
for the benefit of the direct beneficiaries. Then a general overview of Africa is very interesting in that, you know, we, we support so many um, countries with, on the continent. And just a few facts about Africa. As it stands, we are more than 30 million square kilometers in size. And amazingly enough, um, Africa can embrace the US, China, India, Mexico, Peru, France, Spain, and a host of other countries that we wouldn't necessarily be aware of. So the slide just um, indicates, um, you know, the amount of space or the land that is available on the continent. We ourselves include 54 different countries. And quite frankly, the world has enough wealth and resources to support every single person in every country on, on, in the continent. And yet the three poorest countries in the world being Burundi, Central African Republic, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, they still suffer so much poverty and lack. They suffer lack of resource, they suffer lack of education, and this shouldn't be. Quite frankly, it shouldn't be. My current focus at the moment is South Africa because that's where I reside, and, and uh, specifically the southernmost tip of Africa, which we then come into the Western Cape and particularly Cape Town and surrounding areas. Each of the 54 countries in Africa should have its own strategy because we are so different and unique with our challenges. So to list a few, we have the cultural differences we have to live with. We have the huge uh, poverty situation, the lack of health facilities, unemployment to a huge degree. And especially after COVID, that's probably gonna be a lot more education, crime, especially in the Western Cape is one of the notable um, situations that perpetuates, which includes murders, assaults, rapes, violent crimes compared to most other countries. The gangsterism is on the incline, drugs is on the incline, corruption in government, not to exclude that. And then of course, inequalities with regard to women and, the, and empowerment. In order for Asia to impact Africa with fundraising initiatives, I would say that all of the above situations have to be considered first, you know, before a funder should really look at investing, because obviously taking all of that into account, you have to streamline and strategize according to what your focus is as a funder. It's amazing that South Africa, even though not as big a part of the continent and specifically zoning in on, um, the Western Cape. In South Africa, we've got 200,000, over 200,000 nonprofit organizations registered as we stand at the moment, with three and over three and a half thousand just in the Western Cape alone. So you can imagine of the 54 countries in Africa, how many of these nonprofit organizations exist. And quite frankly, many times we are dipping into the same pool of funders, which makes it quite difficult for the funder to support all the need. In the Western Cape, we have a total of 30 municipalities and each of these municipalities have got to support that community environment. The focus areas across uh, the districts are education, art, women empowerment, victim empowerment, once again, youth development, skills development. And from the above, a funder can then zone in. What makes it so much easier for uh, a funder to actually invest in Africa is the fact that they can zone in on the necessary area or the needed area and align it with their, uh, with their interests really before deciding that to invest. And in this way, an Asian funder is assured that investment will be utilized effectively. Um, the monitoring and evaluation will be done accordingly. And with that kind of strategy in place, uh, assured second round funding uh, could be possible. We have a huge amount of struggles and challenges that we face in South Africa, which sets us apart from the rest of the world. And that's why, you know, I must bring this in, but Arch Archbishop Tutu is a big number now. He's 89 years old. He just turned 89 in October. 
And what a wonderful man. And he called us the Rainbow Nation for a very good reason. It's because we encompass all of these different facts and different people. And talk about cosmopolitan. I think we've got every nation on the continent. And, you know, when addressing funding for, for Africa, a fundraiser should be using um, the history, go into our history, know what makes South Africa appealing and unique and different, you know, highlight what sets us apart from other countries and talk about what we have overcome and achieved. And this you can only, this you can only put together once you've actually gone into the past. And our past is not that rosy. We've obviously come through a huge struggle with apartheid uh, being a huge factor um, when contributing to the unemployment, the poverty that exists, the divisions that exist. It, it all stems from our history. But moving forward, we can only look to a positive future for each of our communities if we work together as opposed to trying to correct a situation that was, you know, that evolved over many, many years. So as, as a group of people and inviting international support, together we can make the difference in our communities, not just in South Africa, but throughout Africa. Of course, COVID-19 came and what a devastating effect it has had globally. Um, the pandemic impacted our society more than, than most, I would say, because of the poverty that already exists. The high levels of unemployment that previously were in existence, the poverty, the inequality has further been exacerbated by this, by this situation. It's just unfortunate that, you know, many more of our communities will now be without jobs, um, trying to survive in a very, very unequal situation. As local and international funders are also affected by the economy, we've had a lot less funding coming into the country and in, onto the, into the continent in general. But more than anything, I think it has also awoken a lot of creative thinking amongst nonprofit organizations to keep their organizations alive and thriving. We've had to change it up a little bit and think differently in terms of um, creating sustainable and, and financial stability. Many funders have provided additional support to the grantees in form of COVID-19 relief. And this has come not only from our uh, local governments, but also internationally, many of the governments have seen fit to support the very many causes within Africa. And in spite of COVID-19, our organizations continue to grow, continue to work and continue to impact where they are so very needed. Now, um, I'm just going to read through some of the do's and don'ts that I suggest for successful fundraising in Africa. And this has been taken from experience. So some of the do's that should be applied is once again, I reiterate, learn about our history, especially the apartheid era and how it impacted the very many communities that we support. Familiarize yourself with our struggles and the challenges we are facing as this will inform your fundraising, fundraisers and, and the strategy that will be applied. Understand how these challenges speak to the services that MPOs in Africa provide to our communities. The most important thing that I find with many of our organizations is that, that they are ill-equipped to actually get to a point of compliancy, not because they haven't done it, but it's due to a lack of knowledge and resources more, than, more often than not. Legal documentation and registration will enable them to receive funding, to be uh, nominated as one of the successful operations. But that is one of the, the challenges that we experience uh, in Africa. I suggest that uh, create creativeness, consistency, and engaging all the time with the organizations be a priority. We have very many languages uh, in Africa, in, in total 11. And we have to overcome those language barriers by finding common ground so that we can liaise with each other and communicate effectively for successful outcomes once again. 
And then one of the challenges that we do have is that investors are reluctant to fund many African projects based on the history of the country. And rightly so. Um, you know, you, you, I'm not one to say that, look at an organization and then make a decision. No, we need to provide them with as much information, facts and proof that we can offer the project's execution according to the investor's requirement. The don'ts, one size does not fit all in Africa, unfortunately. Once again, our language could be, could be a stumbling block. The approach to funders, the strategy, and especially taking into account the different regions and areas that uh, we are applying for. Many MPOs in Africa still use the pity aspect of requesting funding, you know, and that has gone out a long time ago. Cap in hand doesn't work with investors anymore. They want to see the facts. They want to know that you're operational and that you've been going for a couple of years and you can actually prove that you've impacted communities. The sad African stories are not enough. They're not enough. Giving facts about the organization is not enough and funders want to window into the operation. They want to actually be part of it. And this can be achieved um, through communication, invitation, and especially informing the investor of the impact on the direct beneficiaries. So those are the do's and don'ts for successful fundraising in Africa that those are just a few that I think fundraisers should take into account when looking at the African continent and deciding to get an investor to support some of our organizations. Then useful tips, there are quite a few, and um, I will just talk about a few of them. Utilizing African stories are really um, impactful. They bring out emotions. And basically when you're fundraising, you're actually appealing to the heart of the investor or the funder. And our stories, some of them, yes, are very sad, but some of them are really amazing in terms of many of the individual uh, beneficiaries from the different communities have gone from being homeless, absolutely poverty stricken and risen above their situations with the correct support and guidance from nonprofit organizations to become doctors and lawyers and attorneys and all kinds of things. So these stories, they really stir the emotions of the investor. And we encourage that stories be your tool that you use when moving forward, especially the African story. Africa is not, not, not easy to promote in terms of positively with funders. And so we say, you know, do your research, identify your donors, marry them accordingly. I still believe that relationships with donors are the way to go. You have to build a relationship in order to encourage that donor or funder to support the organization, not once, but building a relationship with them will, will definitely ensure success in the long term. The fundraising strategy also has to be investigated and completely put in alignment between the organization and the funder. The marriage between those two is critical in order to execute that strategy. Should the MPO be situated in the rural areas, they are removed. They're not as easily um, able to access uh, funding as the, the city or other urban areas within, within the different countries. And we have more organizations situated in our rural areas than not. And an international fundraiser above all has to take into account forming a relationship with the African nonprofit organization, as I said before. And I believe that with all the information that's just been shared, I do believe that Africa is the most colorful and exciting continent to partner with and to support. We have so much talent in this country and we're hoping that through this platform, we will encourage partnership, investment, and growth of the many nonprofit organizations that exist in the various countries, making up 
the African continent. Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. That was excellent. Um, really good information for all of us. 11 languages in 54 countries. We have our work cut out for us if we're going to be successful um, raising money in Asia for Africa. That is for sure. Um, I'd like to open this up for a bit of an exchange. Um, uh, Yusha, can you tell me um, how is COVID impacting fundraising in Asia from Africa or for Africa from your perspective? Well, there has been good and bad, uh, like with all cases um, globally, for that matter, and hence or Asia. A lot of the initial funding uh, was the urgency of need that went to the frontliners, the, the COVID patients, the migrant workers, and so on and so forth. That were the very first, um, you know, stories that came out as COVID started. But as I mentioned in my example. Uh, as that initial, um, you may say, frenzy of giving. In fact, there was a spike in giving, um, both formal and formal to NGOs, to your immediate, you know, community-based fundraising for your immediate community, the works. Uh, but after that, of course, there are more, and like the example, um, people who have not been traveling, who otherwise would travel to Africa um, and not traveling to Africa decided, oh, this time, like, you know, let's also support the African economy by making uh, contributions to a charitable cause. So that, but the, the reality is a lot of that has been initiated by the donor rather than initiated by the NGOs who are doing brilliant work, who is reaching out and saying, hey, you know, uh, let's work together at this time across um, the oceans. Uh, so many of the contribution has been more voluntary by the uh, organization, some of the corporates, or like in the case of the school uh, uh, that I shared with you, they're doing it more out of their, um, their motiv personal motivations rather than the sector actually reaching out to them and giving them, like what Melanie said, a solid story or a solid reason uh, why they should do it. So, Interesting. And are you noticing that any one sector, and Asia is almost big, as big a place as Africa, right? But so if we were going to say the Southeastern Asian countries and South Africa, are there any sectors that you think um, would be uh, that, that you're finding are more successful in being charitable towards, say, for example, South Africa? So from the African point of view, it's mainly the tier one cities, you know, so the capital cities, NGOs, and as Melanie was saying, the real rural ones, because their voice is not really heard. It's not because people don't want to support it. It's just that their voices are not heard. Uh, so it is more the, the national level or even the international level work that's happening in Africa uh, by in INGOs and the big national NGOs that actually is getting heard um, across the oceans. And hence, naturally, uh, the voices that are heard generally gets the attention. Um, so the funding is going that way. Uh, so in my opinion, it, it's possible to raise funds for any cause as long as we can create that linkage. Um, so if the, if the language is a problem, then you, know, you have to figure out but nowadays, you know, with Google Translate, you really, you know, or so any other app like that, uh, you know, uh, and nowadays even Zoom uh, does auto uh, translation. Okay, it may not be 100% perfect, but, you know, you can get the subtitles. So if you're on a Zoom call with a, a potential uh, collaborator, uh, and it's not like you'd make the first call and you get a check sent to you. It's about nurturing relationships. It's it, with technology, it's being done, uh, at least the ones that we're working with, they're doing it and it's working. Uh, but of course, there's always enough reasons to say, oh, it won't work or, oh, it's so difficult. Well, uh, and the yeah. other ones not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are the ones that aren't raising any money. <laughs> so, Melanie, um, do you find that there are many organizations um, Across, across Africa, but especially in South Africa that are actually embedding fundraisers in Asia to benefit Africa using kind of an Oxfam model? 
Yes, um, I do find that many of the organizations are becoming more aware of international funding and, and how much more um, impactful it's becoming as opposed to the little bit that they can grasp from local government or from events or from local fundraising opportunities. And especially Asia, you know, we find that the embassies here are also very open to getting involved with nonprofit organizations and really supporting them. And um, this is what happened with me. You know, I got engaged uh, uh, with, I engaged with uh, Japan and started speaking with the consul there. And, you know, many of, of, of the countries actually don't understand exactly what's happening in the rural areas, in the, in, you know, in the outlying areas. Like Usha said, they're more aware of, of, of the more um, common organizations, the ones that have already been around for 10 or 20 years. So for us to go out as fundraisers and actually speak to what is really literally on our doorsteps, go to the embassies, inform them. That is a platform for us to actually get the word out there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Usha, uh, I, I'm not, I haven't ever approached an embassy for support. I think that's an interesting, an interesting kind of strategy and uh, something that it sounds like fundraisers should be considering. Um, Usha, in your experience, um, are you using an embassy approach? Um, what is your experience there? Totally, um, especially when it comes to religious festivals. So just like, you know, the British embassy may have a Christmas party, an Indian embassy will have a Diwali, Diwali party. That, that's right around the corner, actually. We still have time to go back in the middle of the episode. <laughs> you know, uh, to say, you know, uh, while you are celebrating, would you consider making a contribution? And sometimes it's just from the, from the foreign services uh, folks who are in the embassy, but then at the event, there are business people, there are trade attaches, um, other people that come together, including the local, um, you know, the, the citizens. So if it is in Kenya, you know, the Kenyans are there along with the Indians and others. So similarly, I have found that works in every corner. But again, mm -hmm. the embassies are generally situated in the main capital city. Uh, so when you want to talk about it, you you know you want to expose them to work being done beyond. So just because they're in the capital city doesn't mean they only give to the capital uh, located uh, charity. Sometimes there is a kind of a bias because it's easy to do them stuff like that. But now with COVID, <laughs> you know, the further it doesn't matter because you can still zoom in the executive director of a uh, community entity. Uh, from a rural African province uh, into the embassy in any of the any of the capital cities in Africa. So uh, that's doable. That's doable, and I I find that it's it's being done. Mm. Interesting, very interesting. And that's a lesson um, all of us can learn about fundraising around the globe to throw that into one of our strategies for prospecting. So in your um, in your presentation, um, Usha, you talked of you gave a case study about Laura, who's using who who's not been able to use her eighty thousand pounds a year to travel um, in her favorite place. Um, what what kinds of um, strategies would you recommend a um, charitable institution, nonprofit, NGO, or even academic institution in Africa use to stimulate Laura's passion for the country and, and direct those funds towards those travel funds towards philanthropic funds? Yeah. So um, you need to do research, just like if you were to do a USAID or a different aid. Uh, you would still do some research as to where they give, why they give, how they give, S fill out the copious amounts of forms that they require to be put in, all of that. You would do that. Uh, so you don't have to do any of that, but you really need to reach out to um, who are the chartered flight you know, company. And they are sometimes owned by African, you know, wherever that continent is, right? So that's Europe. So if I'm working in UK, I'm talking to UK uh, owned companies to say, where are these Indians coming from? Where are these Chinese coming from? 
who are investing in travel, in F and B, in the, you know uh, fashion. You know those are the so that's how I generally work to identify two or three entities. You don't need to spread yourself too thin. Just start with one. Talk, start to talk to them about your cause and then share with them. While business may not be great at this point in time because Lara is not coming in, um, but is there a possibility that we could, together with you, write to your clients, uh, email them uh, to, and you don't even need to give us the email, you know, because of the data protection and all that. They may say, oh, we can't give you. Saying, okay, you know, we, we provide you the content with the link to our organization, send it out. And if they click on the link, of course, then they are able to say, give me more information. And then you start conversing with them. And you would converse with them like you would converse with a friend. Just like the travel agent in Africa converses with the folks like Lara, right? Uh, to build that relationship, to build that trust, and then say, hey, come over, use my, you know, my charter flight service or my resort or my um, you know, tour. Um, so yeah, it's exactly what you would do. You would reach out to them and say, uh, let's, let me tell you the story of, you know, this community. And, and we know that you love this continent. And we'd love for that relationship to go beyond just the consumerism part, but to impact. And many of them are like, yeah, you know, never knew this was needed. Now that you're telling me, I'm fine with it. So you may not get the entire 80,000 pounds that she otherwise said, but even if you got 5,000 pounds or 500 pounds for starters, that's the first of the new dollars that you're raising. Interesting. Interesting. So Melanie, what do you think about, um, what do you think about that? How have you seen your clients um, using this incredibly effective strategy or are they still really, as you said, you know, sticking to the hat in the hand, telling the poor story, are they able to use this level of um, data analytics and research, which is what I would term kind of smart fundraising? You see, um, in South Africa particularly, we have to address the different areas that we penetrate. So once again, it comes back to the more informed, the more, um, the more, ex the more organizations that have access. So I would say that if we're looking at suburban or urban areas, yes, They've gone further with their research. They've now got, um, you know, uh, professional researchers on board that apply um, search engines that buy in databases. And in that way, they actually get to uh, engage with more international platforms, uh, more international funding. Is, uh, funders are being made aware of the need. But when we move into the rural areas, like Usha and myself, we've both experienced it. These people don't even have internet. They don't have, they don't have technology that can allow them, yet they're running soup kitchens. They're educating their children. They have schools happening. So they might not be technologically um, supported, but they are using different initiatives. And that's where Unique Foundation comes in. We actually do workshops. So we go out on the road and we, we go to these very remote areas and we teach them about how to fundraise with what you have, where you at. We also introduce the very organizations that we're doing the workshop with to various funders, be it local, national or international. We are acting as the um, the representative or the face of those very organizations that can't get access like that. We act as, as their representatives in promoting their organizations, in getting them compliant, and then obviously looking at possible partnerships to get them funding. So it's a little bit different in, in, in Africa, put it that way, because you know, we've got to divide up the different groups and where the, the different nonprofit organizations are situated and what they actually have to work with. So some of them are at a disadvantage, I would say, when it comes to um, not having 
the amount of awareness that is needed in order to get as many funders on board with them, as opposed to established organizations that are already Im implementing the strategy that Usha's just said, that have the access. So um, yes and no to the question. Mm, very interesting. Very interesting. I have a um, I, that I want to share um, about collaboration, because that's the, the thing that we need to. Because we, you know, in the eighties and nineties and turn of the century, we got pretty good with certain methodologies, grant writing and all that, right? Because that was the norm. Now that we have come to this, and with the digital, while the technology or the internet connections are not available. Uh, mobile has become so much more uh, available. Interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, uh, whether it's TikTok, whether it's some of the, uh, those kind of platforms, a lot of Africans are spending time. You know, I, I showed you the data on uh, smartphone usage. Mm -hmm. uh, forget, like, the entire population, but just work on the population, um, multi-million <laughs> population, mm -hmm. who actually have access to it. Um, so if you can work with your local vendors of these kind of, and that is another way. So if you can't reach the guy who don't have a smartphone, yeah, maybe not difficult. But if there, it is possible, then you can reach out to them. So it is not just uh, between Asia and Africa, but even within Africa and across, you know. Uh, so there are websites for uh, Indian websites where um, different people hang around, you know. So if you are part of that and you share like this story, uh, Humans of New York type of a story, you, even a tiny organization, some of them actually have even smarter uh, stories, you know, that actually uh, kind of is a good fundraising story uh, than some of the very slick productions of the big, big entities um, are drawing. So uh, it's really about segmenting your market and deciding whether which flat platform you would want to uh, be on and then diligently focusing. And of course, if you are a generation, uh, a boomer or a generation X, maybe you still think, oh, they won't. But if you have a young volunteer who's learning with you, he or she will figure out how to get on that platform yeah. and make a big yeah. If you can motivate him or her to yeah. do it. There are plenty I of things that are happening. Yeah, I agree with you there completely. And you know, in Africa, we have a saying, which is uh, Ubuntu, which means the human factor. So through the, through the workshops and through the fact that we, we deal with both of these environments, we say to the more affluent, the more established organizations, you need to collaborate with that one that's sitting out in way out where. You know, and you need to be supporting them because your project is the same. You're doing education, they're doing education. So instead of working in silos, why don't we form a partnership? And in that way, applying for funding just becomes so much easier because of that partnership. So they are empowered. They are, are given an opportunity. And also uh, in saying that, um, you know, mobiles are available. Yes, we have very, very poor people. So we have to apply to service providers like MTN, Vodacom, and, and form that partnership with them where they actually see the need and they then provide these, these communities with a facility that can actually move them forward. So absolutely, yeah. Interesting, a few challenges. Um, uh, definitely de dealing with such a diverse population, that's, that's interesting. Um, we don't have very much time left, but um, if we were to tell um, the uh, international fundraisers participating in, the, in IFAB, um, one thing about fundraising for Africa, one thing they must do and one thing they must not do, what would it be? Um, from my point of view, the one thing that they should do is get to know Africa, get to know the different environments that exist on one continent. And if you're looking at South Africa, it's a very diverse group of people that populate this country. Mm -hmm. And you've got to know what you're talking about. And you've and, and people, um, you know, they, they're in such dire need. There is such a, a need for support that we all 
seem to be dipping into the same pot. So you as a fundraiser, understand that. And, you know, you can't be all things to all people and you can't satisfy everyone. So you've got to make a decision about, you know, which area are you going to pursue? Is it going to be education? Is it going to be skills development? Is it, it'll make your life so much easier in choosing the right organizations to partner with. Mm -hmm. Then the don'ts, I would say, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned them earlier um, in terms of, you know, don't be all things. Don't try and do everything. You know, don't try and, and, and take on every organization because there's so many. You mm -hmm. know, rather focus on those that you know a funder will, um, will be interested in. You know, get your stories in place. Build a relationship more than anything. Build a firm relationship with the organizations that you're choosing to work with. Communicate often, and um, I would say that you you in line for success. Excellent, thank you, Usha. What's your view on that? One one yeah. absolute and one no matter what. Don't. <laughs> so the do I would say, let the Africans control the narrative. Uh, I mm. said that in my uh, mm -hmm. you know, earlier on. Um, you know, let them let let the world see Africa through the lens of an African. Mm -hmm. uh, because all said and done, however much I want to do it, uh, I will bring in my biases. Mm -hmm. So I kind of always believe when I work uh, with any entity, let the ground do the talking. And now with the social media and, and this whole uh, skepticism about fake news and all of that, um, people are looking for authenticity. People are looking for honesty. So... I would rather, if we are raising for Africa, let the people of Africa be the one who control the narrative. And then the rest of the world helps them, joins them uh, to do bigger, better. Uh, that's how I think uh, has been one of the reasons of success, I think. Uh, and I would like to share that uh, as a do. They don't know your fundraising timeline. So if you're going to do uh, online fundraising and you're able to, and you have a solid story, you can expect results in the first three days. If you're going to work with someone like Lara, where you, you know, you're looking to work on, you know, uh, getting the share of wallet of the, you know, the millionaires, and not, you don't even need to be a billionaire. You can just be a, you know, a regular person. Uh, but with a heart for for a, a particular cause or a country or a, or a continent, um, it takes time because it's about relationship. You, know, you don't just ask for marriage on your first day. So you should know that you know, as a fundraiser. And that's going to take a bit of time. Same with the corporate sector. Um, you may need to understand them. And, so know your timeline. If you're working with international schools, in six months you should be able to raise you know, the target that you're planning to raise. To know your timeline so it's not a cookie cutter uh, one you know one size fits all. So don't uh, have a strategy that expects money to flow in when the methodology is not relevant. Excellent. Excellent advice. Well, I have a page full of notes here and um, I've had the opportunity of working with each of you in preparation for this, but really outstanding information and really two gifted um, superior fundraising professionals and we're so pleased that you could join us today thank you so much for your for your time and for your efforts and and good luck to you both as you continue to fundraise um, again thanks for joining um, ifab online i'm sean o'hara um, good luck and happy hunting take care